So welcome to the second MQ difference segment of the M cubed symposium, where we will continue to see how real-time seed funding grows innovation. If you're just joining us, I'm Valerie Johnson, the M cubed managing director, and we are delighted that you're participating in this inaugural M cubed symposium. Again, I want to recognize and express gratitude to the co-sponsors of this landmark event, the Office of the Provost and the Office of the Vice President for Research. We are fortunate to hear now from the Vice President for Research and William Gold Dow, Collegiate Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, Steve Forrest. Thanks, Valerie. It's really a pleasure to be here at this first uh, uh, M cubed symposium and to see all of the creativity that's been, in that's been unle unleashed uh, through the work of, of many, many groups here, just reading through the program and looking at some of those um, uh, activities is really quite an eye opener. Um, one of the things I really want to state here today is something that we've often heard, but it's definitely in this context worth repeating, and that interdisciplinary research is really one of the hallmarks of UM research. And this has been an extraordinary pleasure for me over the years that I have been here. The reputation is very well, well earned because we have very low walls and institutional barriers uh, between our departments and our disciplines. And they, those barriers often impede uh, activities all across academia. So in my view, bringing together the perspectives of multiple disciplines to address the full complexity and challenges around the world is not an option, but is increasingly the hallmark of ground, groundbreaking research. Our ability to be effective in interdisciplinary research at UM is particularly fortunate because the challenges we face in the real world are not neatly divided into academic disciplines, many of which were established a thousand years ago in early university systems. What M cubed has done is to nurture that core strength and in so doing to reinforce our unique culture of cooperation. And as we are seeing today, this has been resulted in a flood of new collaborative ideas and approaches. Four presentations that are up next highlight how effective M cubed has been in bringing together researchers from across campus to address specific challenges. One project brings together faculty and students from computer science, internal medicine, and pharmacy. Another has representatives from biological chemistry, chemistry, and pharmacology. And a third team combines physics, art and design, the performing arts, and engineering. That one I definitely think is an intriguing combination. But let's start with a project entitled Eugenics, Coerced Sterilization in California, a Digital History. The aim of this project is to create a virtual collection of archival, primary, and interpretive materials related to the long history of eugenics in California. These materials are being gathered with an eye toward their historical significance to contemporary issues in genomics and bioethics. The team members include Alexandra Minister, Professor of American Culture at LSA, Siobhan D. Harlow, Professor of Epidemiology at the School of Public Health, Sharon Riley Cardia, also Professor of Epidemiology at SPH and Natalie Lira, a graduate student in American culture at LSNA. In the envelope, please. Oh. Uh, Professor Stern, our presenter. Alexandra, is she here? Yes. Oh, there she Thank is. You. There we go. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to be here to tell you about our project and what we've been doing with our cube. Many of you may be surprised to know that in July of this year, the Center for Investigative Reporting out of Sacramento, California, released an expose showing that 148 female prisoners had been 
sterilized without authorization in two California prisons. According to many of their stories, many of these women had been coerced into these operations. This was one example of a long history of sterilization abuse and reproductive injustice in California. This is a topic that I've spent much of my career looking at. And in fact, I was in Sacramento about six years earlier seeing what I could find in the archives, because that's what historians tend to do. And I was in the California Department of Mental Health, and I happened to meet a really nice secretary, and she told me that she knew there were some microfilm reels that had some data that I might be very interested in. It was she was retiring that week, it was serendipity that I got to meet her, and lo and behold, she pulled open a file cabinet and showed me 19 reels of sterilization authorizations that had been sent to Sacramento from about 10 different institutions from the period of 1922 to 1952. So all of a sudden, on microfilm, I was able to look at 15,000 of these types of records. So this was tremendous. This is a treasure trove of information. It's a huge amount of information. And my bet next big question was, well, what do I do with it? And how can I mine this so we can understand the past more effectively? I knew this data would help me answer a whole variety of questions. Questions about what happened in some of the institutions that you see behind me. The Sonoma State Home, the Patton State Home. And it will allow me to amplify some of the earlier research that I'd done in my book, Eugenic Nation. So at this point, some of you may be wondering, what is eugenics? What is coerced sterilization? So in the briefest of summaries, eugenics is a term that was coined uh, by the British polymath Sir Francis Galton in 1883. It was basically a scientific idea. Today we look back on it as kind of a pseudoscientific idea with the sense that you could apply a complex, a so, you could apply simplistic scientific solutions to complex social problems. But if that sounds somewhat okay, the problem was it came with very deep biases about changing society and about improving the human stock and ideas about who was fit and who was unfit and who should be part of modern progress in societies. So eugenicists, as they call themselves, spent a lot of time figuring out who was fit and unfit, trying to regulate reproduction along those ideals, and also to classify and control groups based on that. Eugenics consisted of a wide array of different practices and programs that ranged from things as whimsical and as innocuous as better baby contests or fitter family contests, which were held at county and state fairs, to immigration control, to marriage laws, to coerced sterilization, and then, of course, to the horrors of concentration camps and genocide in the form of mass euthanasia. So coerced sterilization was always a significant portion of eugenics movements across the globe. What did that consist of? Well, for men, it involved performing vasectomies, usually in institutions where, such as prisons or mental hospitals where they were held as inmates. For women, salponectomies, and later the, more, the simpler procedure of tubal ligations. The reason why they're characterized as coerced is that they did not meet the bar of informed consent as we were required today. In many instances, patients or inmates were told that if they wanted to leave the institution, sterilization was a requisite for release. Um, in other cases, parents rejected or resisted the sterilization of their children, and they were overridden by state authorities. This happened, as many of you know, in Nazi Germany as a lead up to, as a rollout of the Third Reich policies. It happened in the United States in 32 different states. In India, later in the 20th century, as part of population control policies. In Peru, as recently as the 1990s, under the government of Fujimori, where approximately 300,000 indigenous women um, were, tubal ligations were performed on them, and in many other parts of the globe. In the United States, California led the way, by far, performing one-third of the approximately 60,000 sterilizations that occurred in 32 different states. Behind me is um, one of the many charts that was produced by the California Department of Mental Health. This one's from 1941. And what you can see, if, I don't know if you can quite make it out, but by that time, by the summer of 1941, 
almost 15,000 sterilizations had been performed in California, and the state was quite proud of this, hence they featured these charts in their annual reports and in other documents. This graph gives you a sense of how far California surpassed the rest, with the next states being Virginia and North Carolina, and I would like to mention that Michigan comes in fourth in terms of eugenic sterilizations at close to 4,000 performed in the 20th century. These sterilizations were performed at about 10 different institutions scattered across the state. So back to this, the microfilm and the treasure trove of documents. So I was looking at 15,000 sterilization orders all on microfilm and wanted to begin to do something with them. It happened at that time that I began to work with a wonderful graduate student, Natalie Lira, who is the project manager of our data entry team for this project now, and we decided that rather than taking on the whole 15,000, we would start by looking at a subset, 2,000 from Pacific Colony, a, ho a home for the so-called feeble-minded. These were about 2,000 records that went from 1928 to 1951. What we found, we found many things, but one of our initial and most important findings is that at Pacific Colony, and as well by extracting some data from some other lists that were contained in the microfilm, we were able to show that Spanish surnamed patients were sterilized at elevated rates. Um, these were mainly patients of Mexican origin, and they were sterilized at rates of 26% on average from 1928 to 1951 in Pacific Colony at a time when the Mexican population in California never rose above 6.5 percent. So Mexican origin patients were sterilized, but so were many other kinds of men and women, including often people with real or perceived disabilities, such as Charlie Follett. Charlie Follett was sterilized at the Stockton State Home in 1948, and he came forth to tell his story in the early 2000s when the California State Senate all of a sudden became interested in understanding this unsavory aspect of the Golden State's past. He was interviewed by many reporters, he told his story often, and as he said repeatedly, they didn't explain nothing. And this was the case for 20,000 people in California. So with these records that encompassed 75% of these 20,000, I knew that to really mine them, to really use them for qualitative and quantitative analysis effectively, I had to carry out a few steps. The first was just simply to digitize the microfilm. If anyone has ever worked with microfilm, you know that you will be left with permanent vertigo if you spend too much time working with it. So that was the first step, and I'm happy to report it has been digitized and we're able to actually you know, see those in TIFF files now. And then also because my expertise really doesn't go much beyond basic descriptive statistics, I needed to work with colleagues who have expertise in biostatistics in working with large data sets and knowing how to code them and running reg regressions and using programs like SPS, uh, SAS, and REDCAPT. So luckily, I, the MQ project and the possibility came along. And with this, I was able to cube this project with my fantastic colleagues in the School of Public Health, Cher, uh, Siobhan Harlow and Sharon Cardia, both of whom are professors in epidemiology and have expertise respectively on epidemiology and reproductive health and also public health genetics. So this team is really able to bring that multi multidisciplinary approach uh, to these documents. Also the graduate student I mentioned before is, ser is serving remarkably as the project manager of what I call our girl power data entry team. We have um, nine students, seven undergraduates, and two uh, MPH students who are involved in entering this data into the REDCap um, system, and we've just launched that. This work has important policy implications, I think. Some of you may be aware that um, in, over the past years, North Carolina has undertaken an effort to identify victims of its sterilization program. And this past summer, the legislature allocated $10 million to, pre to, to be provided in compensation for identified victims at about $50,000 each. It is possible, and I've been in conversations with people, looking at the possibility that this data set and the information that's gleaned from it, obviously in accordance with human subjects and HIPAA protections and the rest, might be able to be used uh, for similar uh, policy implications and in the name of restorative justice of the victims. So back to the summer of 2013 and the 
California Senate hearing on the sterilizations in the state prisons. Well, that issue continues to play out. Um, by the spring of next year, we should have a report uh, uh, from the audit and from the investigation, understanding what allowed these unauthorized sterilizations to take place, what fell through the cracks. Um, and while that is happening, and in the meantime, with our newly digitized one terabyte driver, which is the first time I've held a full terabyte driver in my hand of data, um, you will be able to find me and the rest of our team um, entering our data and entering the information from all these sterilization orders um, into our database, which ultimately will be the largest database on eugenic sterilization in the world. So thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of the talks.